Welcome to A to Z Sports Prime Time on this Tuesday evening. Lovely to have you guys in for another episode of the Prime Time program. We got a little draft discussion to have tonight. Let's talk about some priorities and how they might have changed now that the Titans have added some free agents. Uh, an additional one this morning, Sebastian Joseph Day formerly of the Chargers and the 49ers. He is the latest addition to your defensive line group. God knows you needed it and continue to need more reinforcements along that line of thinking. So we'll talk about that together. We'll talk about the impact of Calvin Ridley, Lloyd Cushenberry, Kenneth Murray, and Shadobia Wuze, and how they might impact your thinking. You also have, of course, Mason Rudolph under contract now and a couple of other depth guys that are included in this mix. Second wave of free agency is underway and Sebastian Joseph Day is the only one that has been signed by the Titans in this second wave of free agency as we come up on a week of free agency as of officially tomorrow. So we'll talk about the positions that they need to prioritize in this second wave and that they continue to try and work to sign but have had... Uh, less success than they did on the initial open market and get to a gone viral video at the end of the show because that's what we do on Tuesday nights. Always love having you guys in. Always appreciate when you share the broadcast around on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and on Twitch. If you're hanging out on Twitter, please retweet it. Facebook Live, you can share, share not a public. That's in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you are on YouTube or Twitch, make sure you like that video and subscribe to the channel while you're there. We always love when you like the video throughout the course of the broadcast. Let's go ahead and get it going because I know you guys have been waiting patiently, of which we appreciate. Welcome into A to Z Sports Prime Time from the Zen Sports Studios. I'm your host, Buck Rising, and I am proud, as always, to be presented to you by Zen Sports. Download the app, plug in the promo code ATOZTN, get up to $1,000 on that no danger first wager. ZenSports.com for more information. TrueMav Fitness in the Gulch, a new way to work out for the best version of you. TrueMavFitness.com for your first workout free. And Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealership. Two Rivers Ford in Mount Juliet or online at TwoRiversFord.com. You got a lot of additions that you need to continue to make on this roster. But right now, you have a couple of needs that have been filled. And needs that we were going to talk about that we will continue to talk about in the draft process but some that may be less of a priority than others. So to recap, you have Calvin Ridley under contract. He is going to be your wide receiver, 1A, 1B, however you view Hopkins. But there's no question that you are a better wide receiver group with him and Hopkins and NWI. The other two I don't really consider factors until such time as they do something to actually factor into the equation. You have on the offensive line group with Peter Skaronsky, Nicholas petit Frere, Dylan Radens, the addition of Lloyd Cushenberry is huge. Daniel Brunskill is also still under contract here. I would like to see everybody but Skaronsky and Cushenberry replaced in some form or fashion because I don't believe, or rather relegated to depth roles at the very best, and Jalen Duncan is also included into that mix with the six-round pick. Defensively, it's much slimmer pickings, right? Chidobi Awuze is the only defensive back to date. You have Kenneth Murray, who's the underperforming, underwhelming former first-round pick out of Oklahoma, and today, Sebastian Joseph Day to play alongside Jeff Simmons in some form or fashion for a defensive line group that still needs a lot of work to do. So, with all of that being said, and understanding what you have in the running back room, of course, Tony Pollard, uh, in addition to those other signings that we mentioned, Mason Rudolph is a backup quarterback, how much do you think this impacts the draft priorities for the Titans? And simply, how does it it impact your draft priorities for the Titans as we look at this situation? BF, uh, Buck's friend, I assume that's what that stands for. It says that's what it stands for. It says Jalen Duncan has what it takes to make it. Well, based on his, and listen, rookie season is not something to judge his entire career on. So perhaps he will uh, prove otherwise. And with good tutelage under Bill Callahan, Certainly, there are some traits that you like there, but Jalen Duncan, the only worse graded left tackle in a much smaller sample size uh, than Jalen Duncan was Andre Dillard. So you fielded two of the worst left tackles in football last year, and Jalen Duncan is a six-round pick, probably shouldn't have never seen the field, 
at what point that he did see the field, but that speaks to the ineptitude of Dillard. Perhaps Callahan can do something with him. So we'll start with your two rivers Ford take here this evening. How does the Titans free agent signings thus far change your priorities for them? Not their priorities, but your priorities for them in the comment section is where you can let us know on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and on Twitch. Right after I remind you that your Two Rivers Ford take is, of course, made possible by Two Rivers Ford. I spent uh, six hours at Two Rivers Ford today shooting a bunch of TV commercials, but that's because I ride with the South's most trusted Ford dealership. Two Rivers Ford has been serving Middle Tennesseans as one of the nation's top performing Ford dealerships for over 40 years. And no matter how you like to shop, they're there to provide for you with all their new non-specialty Fords below MSRP. Go to Two Rivers Ford in Mount Juliet or online at tworiversford.com. Still need a green dot linebacker, says Hawkins Johnson. That's absolutely true. Kenneth Murray is not going to be your green dot linebacker uh, unless circumstances require him to. And you can ask Los Angeles Chargers fans how that experience went for them last year. He is Rashawn Evans 2.0. As of today, we'll see how much that changes, if they can put him in a better system to suit his skill set, but without another linebacker to run alongside him as a top-line running uh, linebacker to run alongside him. That's a pretty big ask. Otis Reese is the biggest question mark in all of this. I don't, I'm don't. i not interested in seeing Jack, Jack Gibbons start for this team unless absolutely necessary, uh, and even then, that's that's something that should be avoided, even though they did tender him. There are a lot of different ways that you can approach this, and I think a trade back in the first round may benefit you in a variety of different ways because you have so many more needs yet to fill. There is, uh, Van Boy says, seriously, there is no news on Tanny. Is he here next year? Well, of course he's not going to be here next year. You already have three quarterbacks under contract. Why the hell would he be here next year? Um, And I don't think there's any need for there to be uh, news on Tannehill until such time as teams address the quarterback position in the draft. I don't think that he's going to be like Flacco'd where he's pulled off the couch six or seven weeks into the season because teams have sustained injury, but it's possible. He's a veteran starter that can come in, and as teams start to equip themselves like Minnesota, trading with Houston to get two first-round picks to give themselves some flexibility to move around, we'll see what happens with Vegas. Denver has no starting quarterback beyond Jarrett Stidham right now, and I can't imagine that Sean Payton would be down for that experience for an entire season, but it would be a tough sell to bring Tannehill in after the Russell Wilson thing. For Broncos fans, though they've been in quarterback hell since basically 2015 is when Peyton Manning won that Super Bowl. The corpse of Peyton Manning won that Super Bowl. So we will see. Um, But no, of course not. Tannehill's not going to be here next year. But we're talking about draft at this point. How does this impact their draft plans, or how does this impact your priorities for their draft plans? Chosen says he wants to see them get a tackle in the second round. MB says it didn't change. You still choose by your board. Don't chase need. This is uh, this is something that, and and you know, I'm I'm happy to answer that question over and over and over again, and I fully expect to for the next six weeks on the A to Z Sports uh, Instagram Q and A because. People continue to ask, well, what are you hearing about their draft? What are you hearing about their priorities? How does free agency change their draft? And the honest to God answer is, well, I have no idea how that's going to look. It's really tough to determine until such time as they're on the clock, basically. So you can see who went before them, what's available to them, who's there behind them that may be interested in trading up if they don't make a move before they're on the clock. And then you, as Rand Carthon has said, roll the dice and play the board. Now, last year, that led to six picks, all being on offense, and them going through, playing their draft board the way that they felt was in their best interest. And I think that Titans fans are pretty satisfied with the results of Skaronsky to Levis to Spears, books out on Wiley, and Colton Dowell is probably a special teamer at best. Uh, Duncan... If he can turn into some kind of swing tackle, you you would feel good about that. If Callahan can turn him into some kind of uh, quality backup guard or perhaps a starter at some point in his career, that would go a long way as well. But it is impossible to determine what the Titans are going to do, whether it's at 7, 13, 23, or otherwise, without seeing what actually happens during the draft. And I know that's a boring answer, and it's not what Titans fans want to hear. It's not what anybody 
wants to hear about their team when they're asking questions, when you're asking questions about, well, what are they going to do in the draft? How does this change things? Well, again, what players there are they prioritizing? I have no idea what their draft board looks like, nor would they tell, t- tell me, nor does anybody out there know what their draft board looks like other than the people who are the people who are being told what the team's draft board looks like are not putting it out there publicly people who work in this space like Daniel Jeremiah Mel Kuyper Dane Brugler they're the the reason that people are comfortable talking to them is because they won't put that out there but it will inform their analysis as they continue to work through the draft analysis and the draft boards and the draft books draft guides that the athletic will put out here in the near future and things of that nature. Uh, Richie says, picks one through three. Uh, okay, he's talking to somebody else. This is always confusing for me. Van Boy says, Brock Bowers, maybe, maybe. I, again, who's there? Who's around him? The 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 thing, the best way to look at this is, all right, so what have the Titans addressed so far in free agency? They have added a corner, an inside linebacker. They have added a backup quarterback, a running back, uh, a platoon system with Tajay Spears with the running back, a starting center. They have also added a top flight wide receiver in the mix, which should lessen the urgency to an extent at the wide receiver position. But just like the offensive line, you need to continue to supplement that because Kyle Phillips and Traylon Burks have accounted for exactly nothing in their careers to date. And those two are not people that you can rely upon. And in fact, I would like to see them relegated. I would like to see them pushed out of the lineup because they do not contribute in any meaningful way. You also need help on special teams. Returners are something that we continue to talk about year in and year out since damn Darius Jennings was uh, returning kicks for the Titans. And I know that's not the end-all be-all, but your special teams has been a disaster for a variety of different reasons. And not just because Craig Aukerman couldn't figure out how to protect his punter properly, but because you can't nail down a consistent returner. And Tajay Spears may factor into that equation but you want him to focus primarily on being your primary running back because that's what he is. So I think that not knowing how their draft board is set and just looking at the talent clearly, if here's, here's the way that I've had it described to me. Okay. If it is a tackle at seven or if the best available players are a tackle at seven, then the Titans would be most comfortable trading back. If the Titans have the opportunity to get one of these top flight receivers, and I don't know how they have them stacked, I don't know how they favor them, but I know that they've prioritized touchdowns here. I think that they are more likely to take a receiver if they stick at seven than an offensive lineman where they can find them later on in the first round and where teams are willing to come up to get not just playmakers, but quarterbacks as well. And we'll see how teams go about the quarterback draft this year because of course that's the most important thing to all of this so if it is a wide receiver that they value if it is a wide receiver that they have very high on their draft board I bet they would stay at seven I I would venture an educated guess that they would stay at seven if a tackle is what's available to them at seven I think that they would trade back I think that they would garner additional picks and I think that they would address the tackle later in the first round because there are tackles that can work in this system with Bill Callahan and Bill Callahan's tutelage. And it doesn't mean that you're not taking the best possible player. It just means that you're taking, that you're prioritizing all manner of different needs that you have on this roster across the board. Um, Brandon says, hey, Buck, could you address the rumors I'm reading on multiple sites on Burks being on the trading block for late round picks? Nobody's trading for Traylon Burks. If Jerry Judy went for a fifth round pick, nobody's trading for Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks um, is not worth, I mean, I don't know. You would have to toss him into a different trade, but no, I've heard nothing to the effect of Traylon Burks being moved. I think they would move him in a heartbeat if they could, but I don't think there'd be any takers. Uh, Certainly not now. Um, uh, Certainly not ahead of the draft. If Traylon Burks were to be moved, I would imagine it would be after the draft, after teams have addressed the wide receivers, because there are far more competent wide receivers in this draft than Traylon Burks. um, As far as prospects go, I I, I, I don't think they should cut him because two years with a bunch of injuries really isn't fair to him. But I, I think that their, their preference would be to draft another wide receiver, relegate Traylon Burks to a reserve role 
um, as much as humanly possible and and work their way out of the bad juju that he and guys like Caleb Farley continue to carry from a previous regime. So I don't know where you're reading it. I don't know if it's like I, we talk about your aunt on Facebook. I don't know if you're reading posts from your aunt on Facebook or something like that, but nobody credible that I've talked to or heard from has said anything about Traylon Burks being moved. And if it was to happen, I can't imagine it would be before the draft, but we'll see. Uh, Burks is being traded to Indiana University. They wouldn't even want him. He can't play. Uh, he can't stay healthy. It's it's a really, really tough situation. Even when he is healthy, he's not a contributor in a meaningful way. You can't trust him. So how should it impact their draft strategy? Well, I think that to go back to a comment from earlier, well, let's let's tell you guys about Zen Sports before we get into that. Up to $1,000 on your no danger first wager is what Zen Sports offers you. There are also 10 same game parlays on the NBA and the NHL every single day that are boosted for you to participate in. You get in on that action by plugging in the promo code ATOZTN that you see there behind me. ATOZTN in the Zen Sports app. Terms and conditions do apply. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line 1 800 889 9789 is how. You get it done. Must be 21 and up in the state of Tennessee to bet. Looking at their draft priorities, I truly do not think that it tr- that it changes that much. Now, defensively, this roster is a shit show. There are needs all over the place, and I think my preference. So let's let let me give you a hypothetical here because I was talking to a buddy of mine about this today, and it was actually an intelligent conversation, not just well, let's let's trade up and and get Malik uh, or not Malik uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. or something like that, which by the way, to hear Daniel Jeremiah and Dane Brugler say it, he might not be the top wide receiver on people's boards, which is pretty interesting. So let's say that Titans are sitting at seven and they get offers depending on if it's Minnesota at 23. What is Minnesota? Minnesota's got 23 and I want to say 12. Let me look at the NFL draft order real quick. I know that the Las Vegas Raiders have 13. So if it's Vegas, for example, let's say Vegas makes them a good offer to move back in the first round to pick up a third round pick. Well, at that point, I would be comfortable with them trading out of seven, picking a tackle at 13 and addressing an additional an additional lead later on. Minnesota has 11 right now. So 11 and 23 for the Vikings. Then, if it's Minnesota and you get a couple of first-round picks for your seventh overall pick, then I would be comfortable with them drafting a tackle at 11 and probably taking an inside linebacker at 23. I don't know if Junior Colson is going to fall to 23, but you cannot put Kenneth Murray out there as your primary starting inside linebacker. Los Angeles was a mess for a variety of different reasons, but what one of the biggest ones is he couldn't wear the green dot. He couldn't be the one to organize the defense. He's a high-level, hot, very traitsy, toolsy athlete, but for the same reason that Rashawn Evans was not trusted with the green dot around here, Kenneth Murray is basically Rashawn Evans 2.0, and that is not the way that you should go about that. So I think that the trade back makes the most sense with Minnesota. We'll see how far Minnesota is willing to come up. We'll see what happens at 7. Um, with them in particular, and we'll see how much the, the quarterback draft is going to dictate a lot of that, but that would be my preferred plan. A uh, a top a top tackle in the first round and as good an inside linebacker prospect as you can get. Again, I don't know that Junior Colson is going to be there at 23 for them. Peyton Wilson is also somebody that I really like, and he can be had probably later um, at that point because it's a non-premium position in today's NFL, but I sure as hell don't want to see Otis Reese and Kenneth Murray out there running around for the Titans. Uh, This is probably going to be a struggling defense anyway. We will see um, how much it's going to struggle based on the amount of talent that they're able to accumulate between now and the draft just about six weeks from now. Uh, So let's talk about the priorities in the second wave of free agency, which position that they've added a defensive lineman today is part of the equation, but which position do you think they need to prioritize in this second wave of free agency? We'll continue to talk about it together right after I remind you that the primetime program is made possible by TrueMath Fitness in the Gulch. Go to TrueMathFitness.com for that first workout free as a Middle Tennessee resident. No workout is ever recycled or repeated at TrueMath. It's why that they are the best because your body will become stagnant if you continue to repeat the same workouts. It's why 
I personally don't enjoy just going to an open gym because I know that I'll go, I'll get into a habit. I'll start doing the same workouts. I won't continue to improve my physical fitness and my conditioning. And that is what TrueMav is designed specifically to protect against. TrueMavFitness.com for your first workout free. Looking at the second wave of free agency, what positions do they need to prioritize? Jack's junk removal says offensive line, or excuse me, outside linebacker, safety, and defensive back. Well, those, I assume you mean safety and cornerback, Jack, but that's fine. You could just lump all of those under DB. I would agree with you. Michael Kennedy says inside linebacker, not based on what's out there right now. I would prefer them to do that organically. At this point, the caliber of inside linebacker right now is not somebody, not not what I would want running around out there next to Kenneth Murray, as I said. Uh, David Lee says we need a cornerback 2023 or 2024. We can't have Trey Avery out there. I would agree. I think that corner is something that needs to be addressed. And Tredavious White is somebody who I saw Adam Schefter reporting on today who plans to visit with the Titans. Now, Tredavious White is a former All-Pro, and he was a cap casualty in Buffalo. He is only 29 years old, so it's not like he's uh, past his age prime necessarily, but he has had an ACL tear in 2021. Last year, he popped his Achilles and missed the remainder of the year with that. That's a really difficult injury for a corner in particular where your athleticism, wide receiver and corner where the athleticism of a player is most important in the NFL, and that is an injury that saps a considerable amount of athleticism for you from you. And I would be, depending on the price tag, I would be curious what he would want or what he would go for on a one-year deal. But I, he has missed a ton of time. I would prefer, I would honestly prefer them bring back Christian Fulton on a one-year deal because he will be cost effective and, and the hamstring injury is a thing and continues to be a thing for him. But Tredavious White's injuries are much more significant and hamstrings are something that can be worked through. Soft tissue injuries are something that can be worked through. So that would be my preference. And I still think that they need an additional corner beyond one of those two, whomever they might sign. I did see that Fulton is going to visit with the Chargers here in the near future. Now, basically, defensive back is what I would prioritize at this point because they don't have a safety. They don't have a running mate alongside Amani Hooker. Elijah Molden was less than satisfactory there. Molden is still here and can probably find a role in a Denard Wilson defense, but that remains to be seen. Is the Sneed deal realistic? Uh, no, the Sneed deal is not realistic. The Sneed deal was very hot for about, I don't know, 12 to 16 hours, and then Kansas City's price tag was too high, in addition to Sneed's price tag being too high on what he would want on an average annual basis on his contract. It sounds about $22 million a year on average value. A- average annual value. Um, so not impossible, but I would not describe it as realistic. I think that Marcus May is very realistic and he plans to visit with the Titans. That is a, a signing that they should have a pretty good chance at depending on the money that they're offering. And this is a down year for safeties, but this is somebody who Wilson has, uh, Denard Wilson has familiarity with. And I think that is probably the most likely signing to come down and we'll see what their offer ends up being to him. Uh, do I think you get May or Pete? I think you're more likely to get May than Pete because it sounds like Pete wants considerably more money than they are willing to pay right now. Uh, Asil, is that Asil? A silly one says, what about Kayvon Wallace? He signed somewhere else today. Who, who did he sign with? Uh, I saw Tom Pelissero reporting on that earlier. I could probably find that very quickly on Twitter. If you give me just a moment. Uh, he signed with the Seahawks, as a matter of fact, a one-year deal with the Seahawks. He wasn't a bad player, but, um, you know, like I said, this team has needs all over the place, so don't know what the offer is, but he is going to Seattle to play with Mike McDonald, the former Ravens defensive coordinator. Uh, are they sacrificing the defensive build this year? Well, I don't think they're sacrificing. They've added some pieces, and they've missed out on a variety of different players that they had interest in. They had the cap space to spend. It's just players have decided that, other places were more favorable, probably because those other teams are in a better position to win right now. I think people look at what the Texans are doing and and try and compare it to what the Titans are doing. And these are not two teams in the same stratosphere at this point. The Texans are a team that can legitimately compete for a Super Bowl next year. The Titans are very much not. 
I think Titans fans' expectations should be between seven and nine wins next year. And depending how they look in those seven or nine wins, if Levis makes considerable improvement, if the offense takes a step, um, if the defense isn't exactly up to par just yet, but you then can go through the process of, of correcting as much as, as possible on the offense, go into 2025 ready to continue to load up on talent, sign a handful of one-year deals to stop gap. Between seven and nine wins feels like a reasonable expectation for the Titans. And, and maybe they go worse to first the way that the Texans did in 2023, but I think that's less likely. And Stroud is a considerably better prospect at quarterback than is Will Levis. And Will Levis is a huge TBD, huge TBD. They go as Will Levis goes in 2024. And none of us, none of us can predict how Will Levis is going to go. But I'm curious. Um, this is going to be a hugely competitive division. And I think that as much as people want to win right away, and I know the ownership group wants to win right away, you still have to be realistic about this thing. Uh, Chosen says, Buck, why do you think Aziz and Autry didn't stay? Do you think the Titans didn't offer them enough? Uh, yeah, I don't think the ti- I, I don't think the Titans offered them nearly as much as they're getting paid. Aziz is making over $10 million a year. Autry is making $10 million a year at, at 34, 35, 34. Um, they weren't going to pay that for an inside linebacker. They shouldn't pay that for an inside linebacker. And teams like a team like the Texans that already has a Super Bowl contender ready to go can't afford luxury spending because they have basically just as much cap space as you did. So that's an easier justification for them. Titans have needs up and down. Now, they don't have a better inside linebacker than Aziz Alshair. They don't have a better defensive lineman that they've added aside from Jeff Simmons than Danico Autry. So those are going to be glaring holes, and I'm sure Titans fans will bring them up early and often when Autry and Aziz are a part of a defensive unit that is clubbing Will Levis's head in twice a year for the foreseeable future. But again, they are in a much better position to afford those luxury spends than are the Titans right now. The Titans are just trying to get up to a level of competitiveness that they have not recently been able to achieve. M-Boy says the Texans are not a Super Bowl contender. Well, that may be the dumbest uh, that may be the dumbest comment that I've seen this evening and I'm sure there will be many more dumb ones, but that might take the cake. If you watched the Houston Texans last year and saw a rookie quarterback doing things that no other rookie quarterback has done in NFL history and saw the defensive prowess that they were able to achieve with much less talent than they had last year. If you saw the fact that their offensive line was not healthy, that they have a premier left tackle, that they have a bunch of young talent everywhere, that they have great skill position players and continue to add more and will continue to add more in the upcoming draft. To say that the Texans are not a Super Bowl contender, I would, so just let's take it in the AFC, right? Chiefs one, obviously. Ravens two. Bengals probably three, and the Bills will take a slide, though I think that Josh Allen should not be discounted as long as they're there. I would probably put them above the Miami Dolphins, the Houston Texans, so they're no lower than fourth or fifth, depending on how they stack them. And yes, teams, and I see some people pointing out uh, that the that there is tape on C.J. Stroud and on Bobby Slowick's offense, and that will be something that they have to work through. But again, I say to you, that rookie quarterback did things that not Joe Burrow did in his rookie year, that Justin Herbert didn't do in his rookie year. He achieved things that no other rookie quarterback has done in the history of the league. If you are ignoring that, you are either stupid or foolish, and I don't know which one is worse. So uh, we will continue to uh, we will continue to uh, keep an eye on those things. It's going to be a fun division for sure, and how the Titans go about making noise in this is going to be a huge talking point this year because they are fourth out of four heading into 2024 for sure. That's how they finished in 2023 and they will uh, and they will continue to have to find ways to win. But I think it's going to be competitive. I think that they can cause the Texans problems, but the Texans are a considerably better football team right now and in better position to win. To ignore that is again either stupid or foolish and I don't know which one you want to be. Either way, let's wrap things up with a gone viral video. Uh, in the comments on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. What's the best sports documentary that you've seen in recent memory? Let me know in the comments uh, as we discussed. Right after I remind you that the Primetime Show is made possible by the Ashton Real Estate Group of REMAX Advantage. GaryAshton.com is where you go for your dream address without the stress. The Intel Edge you need to succeed can be found at GaryAshton.com. All right. So, what's the best sports documentary that you've seen of late? 
I have a, a lot of problems with re- the most recent, the best sports documentary that I've seen recently is the one that t- was done by HBO on uh, Tiger Woods. Now, that's been several years ago. In fact, I think that that was filmed back in 2021, but I haven't seen one worth a damn since then. It was way better than The Last Dance. I thought The Last Dance was basically a Michael Jordan, glad handing Jordan brand Nike commercial for six hours. And there were some parts of it that were fun. Before the Tiger Woods two part on HBO, I would say that OJ Simpson. But there's not a lot of good sports documentaries out there because athletes have final say on this and they don't want to be portrayed portrayed in a poor light. They want their legacies, their greatness to be remembered for all time. And that is not something that necessarily lends itself to honest telling, honest telling of their stories. Now, that seems to have happened again in the latest produced on one of the latest produced by Apple TV, which is called Dynasty about the New England Patriots. And apparently a lot of the Patriots players that were talked to about this are not happy with how the thing is being portrayed. I think, you know, watching the Patriots documentary, it didn't tell the stories like of me coming and Corey Dillon. And I mean, I, I interviewed for five or six hours. I was in New York and all they had me saying was, fuck them all, fuck them all. Like, that's it. You felt, I felt like I got kind of duped. I was like, man, this is going to be great. Like the storytelling, we're talking about this and we're talking about that. Everything that we all gave to the 20 years that it encompassed, they only hit anything that was negative. Hey, we won at a high level and guys stayed there. Like I I could have left two times. I signed back. There's reasons why. Like they act like the last three or four years because the Patriots have struggled that Bill can't coach. Bill made some mistakes and he wasn't always the nicest or the purest guy. But at the end of the day, he always did whatever it did, whatever he had to do to make the team better. Think about this. He gave me an opportunity, a fifth round draft choice. He gave Tom Brady an opportunity. He set on a hundred million dollar quarterback when no one thought it was popular and started Tom Brady. Malcolm Butler was forget undrafted free agent. He was a tryout guy. He gives guys who are the underdog an opportunity. No one talks about that. When everybody else is done with a guy, he brings in a Corey Dillon. He brings in a Randy Moss. He brings in a Rodney Harrison. And I just don't think that he got enough credit, enough respect, enough props. Man, this dude is the greatest coach of all time. So that's Rodney Harrison and Devin McCourty talking about Dynasty, the latest documentary produced on Apple TV about the Patriots. Apparently, that is not an accurate telling. And I think, you know, it's a struggle with with as many as – listen, athletes – have had the have been able to overcorrect on how much not in control they were of telling their own stories. And now that shift has obviously come in in the state of sports media and people being able to have their own platforms and build out their own YouTube channels, this, that, and the other. But you know, I just don't know if we're ever going to get an accurate, honest documentary at this point when athletes have the ability. And and listen, they're caping up for Bill Belichick there. Bill Belichick is somebody who probably deserves, I mean, less credit than Tom Brady for sure, but there is no disputing that the greatest coach in the history of professional football is Bill Belichick. And I have not yet had an opportunity to watch the documentary. I'd be curious to see it. I'd be curious to see if Rabel's featured in it because obviously he was a very big part of those first, uh, that first three Super Bowl run that the Brady Belichick Patriots went on before they had about a decade in between their next three Super Bowls that they won an organization. But, you know, I'm just always, I'm, I feel like I watch these things and I'm just perpetually disappointed because when the athlete has final say, they can nix a lot of the honest and, and dirty stuff and grimy stuff that they don't want out there about their legacy. And it seems like that has happened to Bill Belichick in the middle of all of this. That's going to do it for us tonight on the primetime program. Radio show tomorrow, Nate Washington, Titans legend, going to be on with us. We'll talk about the wide receivers and the offense, what he likes about their offseason, what he doesn't like about their offseason from 10 to 1 on 104.5 The Zone. We hope you will join us. Last primetime show tomorrow for a couple of days because I have a bunch of vacation coming up. A quick trip to the West Coast for a wedding. I'm looking forward to that and spending a couple of days at the beach. So we'll have fun tomorrow night on primetime. But if I don't see you then, I'll talk to you from 10 to 1 on 104.5 The Zone. Have a great rest of your evening.